The story of Britain's King George VI and his Queen Elizabeth is a story of goodness growing to greatness and a story that proves the old saying, behind every great man is a great woman. In a short reign, just 14 years, George and Elizabeth created an ideal of the British royal family, writing a script, devising a format that dominated the idea of what the monarchy should be. A model example of family life, lived by a king and queen, sharing the hopes and wants of decent, ordinary people. Marriage and reign are inseparable. The tale lies decades in the past, yet the legacy of George and Elizabeth lives on in the way that their eldest daughter rules as Elizabeth II. The older Queen Elizabeth would live on for 50 years as the Queen Mother, a central character in the royal story. If today the future of the monarchy is doubted, it's because the scenario imagined by the old king and queen is failing. What they built was strong enough to survive, but not flexible enough to change. In truth, George and Elizabeth did not invent the royal family as an ideal family. Rather, they perfected the perfect royal family. George VI's great-grandparents, Queen Victoria and her husband Prince Albert, were the very first to be sold to the British people as ordinary. Before Victoria, kings and queens might have been admired, respected and glorified. But the idea that they were an ideal of family life would not have been understood, even thought ludicrous. Even then, it was royal propaganda. Victoria and Albert had difficult times with their children, especially the eldest, who would become King Edward VII. Behind his public image, Edward VII, George VI's grandfather, was an immoral man, someone today we would call a sex addict. George VI's father, George V, while faithful to his wife, Queen Mary, was a cruel and distant parent, in modern terms, emotionally abusive. Early images of the boy who would become George VI shows him, his brothers and sister, drilled like soldiers by their father. Projecting the image of a man surrounded by children and grandchildren behind palace doors, George V was a pitiless bully, one saying, my father was frightened of his mother, I was frightened of my father, and I am damn well going to make sure that my children are frightened of me. There were physical beatings, but mainly ruthless criticism and fault finding. The royal children could do nothing right. George V feared his children would be surrounded with sycophancy and was determined to compensate for such by cutting them down to size. The development of his children as emotionally stable and independent was disrupted by this lack of unconditional love, complicated further by the king's contradictory notion that despite their lack of worth, his children were not to behave like other children. A conflicting notion was ingrained into his children and carried into adulthood. They never knew exactly where they stood. But with King George VI and his Queen Elizabeth, the happy family you saw was what you really got. George and Elizabeth's story perhaps proves such a thing as destiny. George VI was born Prince Albert, Bertie to his family the second son of George V and Queen Mary. When Prince Albert was born, few imagined he would be king. Albert's eldest brother, Edward, Prince of Wales, David to the family, was the first in line for the throne. While Edward had his own problems with his father, he had charm, confidence and wit. He was idolized by the press and public, nicknaming him Prince Charming. 
Bertie got used to being second in everything, just a spare. He was nervous, highly strung, and crucified by shyness. A natural left-hander, forced to be right-handed. He had a powerful stammer, and tormented by nervous twitches and uncontrollable rages. I'm sure that we are all happy to feel that the generosity of His Majesty. Struggling with his speech, Albert was viciously taunted by George V. The public speeches the stammering prince had to make were a personal hell. Albert was, however, a natural athlete, a superb shot, and good enough tennis player to play at Wimbledon. He joined and loved the British Navy, serving in the Battle of Jutland when the fleets of Germany and Britain clashed in 1915. Those who really knew Bertie saw past the shyness and stammering, finding a man of real courage. King George V grudgingly said of his second son, Bertie has more guts than the rest of them put together. After the First World War, the King created Albert, the Duke of York. Prince Albert married Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon on the 26th of April 1923. When they married, no one ever expected they would become king and queen. Elizabeth Bowes Lyon was the daughter of a Scottish aristocrat, the Earl of Strathmore. Born on the 4th of August 1900, Elizabeth enjoyed a childhood unlike her husband's, a time of happiness, fun and a deep sense of security. Elizabeth's mother loved life and encouraged her children's education in culture and the arts. Lady Elizabeth's father was quiet, dignified and conscientious about his position, believing wealth and privilege brought duty and responsibility. While Elizabeth's parents were devoutly religious, they were not joyless Puritans. Regular evening prayers were followed by cocktails before dinner. Elizabeth's childhood home, Glam's Castle in Scotland, was a nursing home for the wounded during the Great War, housing 1,500 soldiers. Elizabeth was just 14. Lady Elizabeth was not fashionable or a great beauty, yet men adored her. She was a petite, dark-haired, blue-eyed debutante, elegant, with a beautiful smile. She was funny, confident, with a powerful personality, an incredible flirt, yet proper at all times. She could have married whomever she liked. The love story began in early 1920. In classic romantic style, Prince Albert fell head over heels in love with Elizabeth across a crowded London ballroom. Far from being swept off her feet, Elizabeth treated this royal attention with great care. She had rejected two proposals from Albert in the spring and autumn of 1921. Royal life offered little to a wealthy aristocrat's daughter. Prince Albert, however, was desperately in love and did not give up. He was in love once and forever, placing her at the center of his universe. Those around the Duke of York thought it a lost cause. Albert's elder brother wrote, Little Elizabeth Lyon, Duchess of York, I don't think. Decisively, Queen Mary, captivated by Elizabeth, became certain that this was the girl to make her distempered son happy. Through Albert's refusal to give up and gentle, relentless pressure by those around her, Elizabeth's resistance was slowly broken. A rumor that Elizabeth was to marry his eldest brother forced Albert to propose again. This time, she accepted. 
Elizabeth later told a friend, it was my duty to marry Bertie, and I fell in love with him afterwards. Elizabeth was honorable. She knew she could help Albert, and despite their different personalities, they shared so much. They were both deeply religious, had a strong sense of duty, and over time, affectionate love for each other. Elizabeth's only mistake was to provide an informal newspaper interview about her engagement, referring to her husband as Bertie. She received a stern telling off by the king, and she was never to speak out again. King George V ruled the wedding should be as quiet and as modest as a marriage in Westminster Abbey could be. The old king said, after all, it's not as if Bertie is heir to the throne. It was second place once again for Albert. The Duke and Duchess of York's marriage was a happy one. Witnesses claim they were deeply engrossed in each other at social occasions, sharing personal jokes. Elizabeth lightened the whole royal family. George V was described as always in good temper whenever Elizabeth was around. George V, a martinet for timekeeping, forgave Elizabeth's lateness, remarking, you are not late, my dear. We must have sat down two minutes early. Elizabeth and Albert brought their first child, Princess Elizabeth, into the world on the 21st of April, 1926. The birth of Elizabeth Alexandra Mary was difficult, needing a caesarean section. It had been a long time since there'd been a baby in the royal family, and the birth threw the Duke and Duchess into the media spotlight for the first time. Their second child, Margaret Rose, was born at Glans on the 21st of August, 1930. Yet more difficulties meant that the Duchess could not risk a further pregnancy. There would be no more babies. The Duke and Duchess doted on their children. The Duke was close to the young Elizabeth emotionally and in character. They understood each other deeply. She inherited his shyness. Margaret was the delight in her father's life, a playful, affectionate bundle that both embarrassed and pleased him. The Duke and Duchess of York broke the pattern of coldness shaping the royal family's relationships, giving their children warmth and affection. That is not to say they were a normal family, the Duke and Duchess would disappear for months at a time, visiting far-flung parts of the empire. But the two princesses were brought up knowing that their parents loved them. The little family that the Duke and Duchess of York created, what Albert called Us Four, was a closed little world, where the inhabitants pretended that they were ordinary. Newsreel images of the time show the Duke and Duchess with the young Elizabeth and Margaret on outings like any family. They were never ordinary. An army of staff surrounded the children. They were taught privately by a governess and cared for by nannies, rarely meeting other children. Albert became known in the 1920s and 1930s as the Industrial Prince, busying himself with worthy trade exhibitions and factory visits. He also founded the Duke of York's camps, summer camps, bringing boys of all backgrounds together in healthy outdoor activities. Albert, the sportsman, enjoyed the fun and games whilst Albert, the shy man, relaxed in simple company. The camps featured community singing, in which he would enthusiastically take part. This small family could have become a sideline of history, with Elizabeth and Margaret obscure members of the royal family, old ladies whose identity television has to explain on rare public appearances. But Prince Edward, Uncle David would turn it all upside down.
On the 20th of January 1936, King George V died, helped on his way by a lethal injection from his doctor, Lord Dawson. On his deathbed, the old king said of his eldest son, After I am gone, the boy will ruin himself in 12 months. George V's bullying made Edward a man of low self-esteem. The new king was of a generation of men scarred by World War I. Edward had been forbidden to serve in the front line, forced to watch friends go to their deaths. Edward hated himself. Edward had found it hard to make a stable relationship with women. He had preferred to seduce other men's wives. Yet Britain's new king was stunningly popular. People saw a new king for a modern world. The new king had a secret. He was in love with Wallace Simpson, a divorcee already separated from her second husband. Wallace was chic, American, intelligent, slim, a near anorexic, and ruthlessly ambitious. Edward was passionately in love. His low self-esteem drove him to Wallace, a woman some would call a sadistic dominatrix. She would humiliate him in company, forcing him to wait on her every whim. Repeatedly broke the rules. He interfered in politics, and it is a dark secret of royal history that he was probably a Nazi sympathizer. Edward thought himself above the government, declaring in private that he would marry Wallace, that Wallace would be Queen of England and Empress of India. British Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin wanted rid of the king, who he thought dangerous, and tricked the king into asking the government for advice on the proposed marriage, advice that legally the king would have to take, give up Wallace or abdicate. It was a time of great emotional turmoil for Albert and Elizabeth. Albert was paralyzed with fear of being king, of being in the public eye, having to get important things right all the time. He was terrified for his children, who would be unable to live normal, happy lives. Characteristically, Albert was unable to express his feelings. In a letter to his brother, Albert took an assuring tone stating that he knew that whatever Edward would decide to do would be in the best interests of his country and empire. Revealingly, Elizabeth also wrote to the king, pleading with her brother-in-law, Darling David, you have no idea how hard it has been for Albert lately. I know he is fonder of you than anybody else. I am terrified for him. So do help him, and for God's sake, don't tell him I have written. Despite the royal family's desperate pleas for Edward to see reason and save Albert and Elizabeth, Edward VIII chose the woman he loved and abdicated. Albert was to become king. Close to a complete nervous breakdown, he burst into hysterical tears on the shoulder of his stone-faced mother, Mary. Elizabeth was heard to remark, I feel like the proverbial sheep being led to the slaughter. As always, when the royal family runs into trouble, the future of the monarchy, whether Britain needs kings at all, begins to be questioned. The challenge for the new king, his wife and children was immense, to save the monarchy. The day and the hour, and almost king's weather for the great occasion. The reign of the previous day King George the VI's coronation the sunshine, took place on the 12th of May, 1937. It was a propaganda set piece. Although the country was in the depth of economic depression, no expense was spared to save the monarchy and erase Edward VIII from memory.
Queen Mary's dress alone was laden in gems worth $2 million in 1936 prices. The aim was the creation of a theatrical fairy tale fantasy. Public opinion was such that the new king abandoned his own name to reign as King George VI. King Albert simply sounded too German. Many, including Albert, feared he was simply not up to being king. City traders were placing bets that the king would not even finish the ceremony. Ordinarily, the king's speeches were written for his disability, with difficult words avoided. The coronation required oaths swearing in ancient, unchangeable language. The new king repeatedly practiced his signature, fearing he might sign himself Albert, not George R.I. The BBC asked to broadcast the coronation live on primetime television. The Archbishop of Canterbury refused, saying it would be sacrilege, as the broadcast might be watched in bars. The real reason was that a live broadcast could not be edited to hide the King's twitches, convulsions and stammer. The ceremony did not go entirely smoothly. Words of the speeches carefully structured by the King's speech therapist were covered over by fingers of officials holding prompt cards. A marker used to make sure the crown was placed the right way round had been removed. The Archbishop of Canterbury was so unwell that a doctor stood by with a hidden syringe of amphetamine to make sure the primate finished the ceremony. George VI was deeply affected by the coronation's religious meaning, the consecration and the dedication before God of an ordinary human. It is a measure of the courage, the guts his father noted, that the new king got through it successfully. We are so particularly together, leaning on each other, Elizabeth wrote to the Archbishop. We are not afraid. I feel that God has enabled us to face the situation calmly. But behind the scenes, a family feud was spiraling out of control between the two brothers. George was forced to talk with his older brother via the long-distance telephones of the 1930s. Technical inadequacy and David's tendency to talk at his brother, alongside George's inability to respond quickly, placed a great strain upon their relationship. The result was Bertie simply chose to put an end to seemingly pointless conversations. David, used to having things his way, found the decision unbelievable. It was the beginning of an unshakable hostility. Spurred by Wallace, Edward directed his attention to money, insisting he had nothing to live on. Two of the royal family's favorite houses, Sandringham and Balmoral, did not go with the job of king. They are personal property. Edward kept them, insisting his brother must buy them from him. Edward lied. It came out he had a huge secret fortune built up as the Prince of Wales. The king was distraught by his brother's outrageous deception. Following 12 months of bitter feuding, Bertie chose to pay off his brother with the full sum requested, 25,000 pounds a year. After Edward's abdication, George had created his brother the Duke of Windsor. Edward married Wallace shortly after her divorce. Royal relations were not permitted to attend the ceremony and Wallace was denied the title Her Royal Highness. Both George's wife and the new queen and the old queen argued there was every chance the marriage would fail and Wallace, who the royal women thought the lowest of the low, would sell and exploit her royal rank. The effect on the king's brother, unable to provide the honor and dignity for his new wife that she so craved and that he felt she deserved, was overwhelming anger and resentment. 
Both the Duke and Duchess of Windsor came to hate the growing popularity of the new king and queen and the two princesses. The ultra-chic Duchess wrote furiously to her husband, look how much she is enjoying being queen, and mocked Elizabeth, calling her cookie, saying the queen resembled their plump Scots cook. The ex-King Edward kept much of his popularity. Cinema audiences cheered his image. George VI feared his brother was plotting a return, perhaps conspiring with Nazi Germany. Edward and Wallace promptly visited Germany and met Hitler. Newsreels were edited to hide the ex-King and his wife giving the Nazis salute. In a newspaper interview, Edward suggested that if a future British government were to create a republic, he would be willing to serve as president. George tried to make his brother's exile legally enforced, but in the end, the law was not needed. George and his queen won the British people over. Before the coronation, the Duke of York had stood out in his ordinariness. His wife, nice, but dowdy. Following the coronation, the new royal family was hurled into a feverish schedule, taking them to every corner of the British Dominion. The royal family began to use the media. Newsreels filled with the king, queen and the two attractive little princesses. It was thought important for the royal family's recovery to be seen doing exactly what royalty always did, without change. The annual visit to Balmoral, the annual Trooping the Colour ceremony and the traditional palace garden parties, all projected onto cinema screens. And always they included the two children, symbols of continuity of the monarchy and the normality of their family life. Queen Elizabeth gave tremendous strength to George VI to overcome his shyness, and he grew as king. The royal family represented Britain abroad, coupling the traditional mystique of royalty with simple family values. It began to be treated more as a show, a drama, in which the characters appeared in costume. Elizabeth simply did not have the figure or the instinct for the fashions of the late 1930s, so she invented her own unique style, wearing fairy tale dresses especially designed for her part as queen. George VI continued his work with young people, introducing it to his own children. As this camp was filmed in the summer of 1938, the Munich crisis was unfolding. Like most Britons, George and Elizabeth supported Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's policy of appeasement, giving Hitler what he wanted to avoid a new European war. The King's own diary recalled a time when he was young in the Royal Navy, cheering the declaration of war with Germany. Now, he wrote, We were not prepared for what we found a modern war really was. Those of us who had been through the Great War never wanted another. The King opposed and feared Winston Churchill, thought by nearly everyone a near madman who would bring war. The King honoured Chamberlain, inviting the Prime Minister onto the Buckingham Palace balcony to celebrate the infamous deal with Hitler that gave the dictator Czechoslovakia but promised peace in our time. It was the first time a British Premier had stood there, and only one since, Winston Churchill. The little royal family and the love story of the King and Queen were part of what the British people wanted and needed, a blanket to wrap against the world. Queen Elizabeth may have been a privileged aristocrat, 
but could relate to ordinary people. Before the cameras, the Queen visited the poorest parts of London, leaving them feeling the Queen knew and cared. It was an ability compared in later years with that of Diana Spencer. In 1939, the King and Queen undertook a tour of Canada and the United States, a challenge, as many Americans still thought Edward and Wallace the real King and Queen. Newsreels showed intimate pictures of the family preparing to depart, simple moments, like the King having his hair brushed aside by his daughter, images unthinkably intrusive only a few years before. The tour of North America was a tremendous success. As the returning King and Queen drove through London, a wave of love and adulation spread over the royal family. Soon, the King and Queen would be facing the ultimate trial of their reign. It would also be their greatest triumph. Britain would be at war. The good man was to become a great king. The royal family was to become a weapon of mass destruction in Britain's media war. The king vowed that as long as the war lasted, he would appear in uniform. The king and queen tirelessly visited the armed forces, bombed civilians and war factories. To those with shattered homes and bodies, a royal visit was a symbol that the whole British nation knew and cared. The Queen's talent for communication and empathy had strengthened a nervous and anxious King performing his royal duties. In the same way, she strengthened the British people during the war. After the Queen's visits to factories, production figures always improved. Not everyone loved Elizabeth. French Prime Minister Édouard Deladier remarked, Elizabeth was an excessively ambitious young woman who would be ready to sacrifice every other country in the world so that she may remain queen. On Christmas Day, 1939, George delivered the most memorable broadcast of his reign. He borrowed the words from an obscure poem, standing for what George and Elizabeth meant to the British fighting for their way of life. I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the un... Hubs were marked with depth lines to limit water use. Palaces were stripped of their grand finery. They became dark and icy. Heating and lighting was limited. Royal parklands were ploughed as the king played his part digging for victory as Britain tried to feed itself. The king and queen's little family was projected as what was good about Britain. The king and his daughters counterpoint to the strutting dictatorships of Italy and Germany and the tyranny of Soviet Bolshevism. Many British children were evacuated to safety away from air attack. There was talk of sending Elizabeth and Margaret to Canada but the Queen publicly demonstrated the love and dedication of the King for his people by stating, The children will not go without me. I will not leave without the King. The King will stay, come what may. When visiting a bomb site, someone called out above the crowd, Thank God for a good King. To which he replied, Thank God for a good people. There were deliberate attempts by German forces to assassinate the king. The king was of the opinion that the bombing of Buckingham Palace was the work of a German relative in the Nazi Air Force. The queen looked at the event differently, producing what today would be called a soundbite. At least I can now look the East End in the face. The king and queen also feared a kidnapping attempt by Nazi special forces.
Elizabeth is not all soft sympathy. An army deserter broke into Buckingham Palace hoping to win the Queen's sympathy, but she was tough on the man, telling him to take your punishment like a man and serve your country like one. Britain's Prime Minister meets the Sovereign every week. Churchill knew terrible truths about the war, knowledge he could share with no one except the King. One of George VI's greatest wartime services was to be Churchill's confessor, sharing the burden of terrible, fearsome secrets. The King knew when Nazi U-boats were starving Britain to the edge of submission. He knew that Allied lives were being sacrificed to hide the breaking of secret German codes. How many RAF planes were really shot down during the Battle of Britain? About the Holocaust. And the King knew about the atomic bomb. George VI had the courage to know and hide the truth, when all around were cheerful and optimistic. The King was idolized by his daughter Elizabeth, who saw in him a true war hero, sacrificing everything for his country. To understand the relationship between George and his eldest daughter is to understand how the princess would in time do her own duty and judge her own children. The royal family shared in personal tragedy, losing the king's youngest brother George, the Duke of Kent, killed in an air crash whilst serving with the RAF. At the end of the war, George and Elizabeth could rightly share in the victory celebrations. On VE Day, the royal couple stood upon the balcony of Buckingham Palace. Their daughters joined them before secretly wandering the streets and shouting with the crowd for the king to come forth. This is movie turn. This is movie turn. Leslie Mitchell reporting. Yesterday morning at 2.41 a.m. at General Eisenhower's headquarters, General Jodl the representative of the German High Command and of Grand Admiral Dönitz, the designated head of the German state, signed the act of unconditional surrender of all German land, sea and air forces in Europe to the Allied Expeditionary Forces and simultaneously to the Soviet High Command. Hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday the 8th of May. But in the interest of saving lives, the ceasefire began yesterday to be sounded along all the fronts. The German war is therefore at an end. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. Today is victory in Europe day. This was the moment we'd all been waiting for. Enormous crowds had gathered outside the house and all over the centre of London to hear the end of the war in Europe officially announced by the Prime Minister. True, VE Day had been anticipated by the people of London who'd done a bit of unofficial celebrating the previous evening. But this was the real moment and this is how Winston Churchill ended his broadcast. Advance Britannia. Long live the cause of freedom. God save the King. After the Premier had repeated his announcement to the House of Commons, the Speaker led a procession of members headed by Mr. Churchill and Mr. Greenwood across to St. Margaret's for a victory thanksgiving service. Meanwhile, of course, Londoners had begun their non-stop two-day celebration. The end of the German war had come 11 months after the landings in Normandy, 
V-Day came less than a year after D-Day. But it was the end of nearly six years of war in Europe. No wonder people went a bit crazy. And this was it in the West End. All over the capital, as indeed in towns and cities throughout the country, it was the same story. This was it in Lambeth Walk. When the land of people are about, there'll only be one winner. That's the land of people will fight anybody in the United Kingdom or outside the United Kingdom. Almost right up to the end, London and southern England had been under fire. London certainly had as much right as anywhere to celebrate victory, and London certainly did. Naturally, approaches to Buckingham Palace were almost continually jammed. Vast crowds outside the palace cheering and waiting. And when the royal family appeared first by themselves and later with Winston Churchill, how they cheered. and through most of the night, London's millions kept it up. The real lights of London were not yet on, but that wasn't going to stop the celebration for a second. Everyone realized perfectly well that although the German war was over, the Japanese war was not. But for 48 hours at least, rejoicing was off the ration. the king and queen had answered call after call, so it was again at night. Thousands upon thousands went to the palace, 
For this is a way we have in Great Britain. The family and the head of the family rejoice together. It was at nine o'clock on VE Day that the King had broadcast his message to the people of Britain, the British Empire, and the Commonwealth of Nations. But today, we give thanks to God for a great deliverance. Speaking from our empire's oldest capital city, war battered, I would never for one moment daunted or dismayed. Of Germany, of the enemy who drove all Europe into war, has been finally overcome. In the Far East, we have yet to deal with the Japanese, a determined and cruel foe. The Queen and I know of the ordeals which you have endured throughout the Commonwealth and Empire. We are proud to have shared some of them with you. And we know also that we shall all face the future together in the hour of danger that we humbly committed our cause into the hand of God. And he has been our strength and shield. Let us thank him for his mercies. And in this hour of victory, to commit ourselves and our new task to the guidance of the same strong hand. Triumph hid the truth. The world was changing, and Britain no longer the country and empire of 1939. George and Elizabeth were to be the last King Emperor and Queen Empress. The jewel in the imperial crown, India, was to become independent in 1947, ripping the heart out of the British Empire. With India gone, the rest would soon follow. George regretted the loss of his imperial title, he also dreaded losing something more precious, his eldest daughter. Elizabeth first met the man who would become her husband, Prince Philip of Greece, in 1939. She was just 13. Princess Elizabeth had fallen in love once and forever. Writing to Philip throughout the war, making her feel grown up to have a boy in uniform to worry about. The King has been called an overprotective father. His relationship with Elizabeth and Margaret falls into a pattern. Children who lack secure and loving relationships with their parents develop over-possessive relationships with their own children. But many men will know the King simply found it hard to believe his daughter could fall so conclusively in love with the first man she really met. Both King and Queen wanted Elizabeth to make a happy marriage, but the choices were limited. The King believed his daughter must marry a man of royal rank. By law, Elizabeth could not marry a Catholic. Most available Protestant princes were Germans. In the end, the simple fact that his daughter was crazily in love with Philip made up the king's mind. Philip proposed in 1946 that the king forbade making the engagement public until a year later, wanting his family to be together one last time on a tour of South Africa in 1947. Those thinking the British royal family is not a political force have too simple an idea. The South African trip taken on battleship HMS Vanguard was very political. South Africa was a divided, self-governing dominion of the British Empire. White South Africans of Dutch descent, Afrikaners, hated the British connection after the Boer Wars at the start of the 20th century 
forcing them into the British Empire. White South Africans of British ancestry saw themselves as part of British civilization. The British ruled with paternal racism, believing they were looking after what were thought the simple native peoples, but still acknowledged basic human rights. The empire aimed to bring non-white people to some national adulthood. Afrikaners saw a different world, believing themselves chosen by God to rule, and saw black Africans as subhuman. The king's visit was lending support to the existing government of Jan Schmutz, who, though an Afrikaner, led an alliance between British and Dutch communities. A new hardline Afrikaner movement, the National Party, was threatening to bring a new order. The trip was also intended to give the king a holiday. The war had drained him of his strength but it was to be no easy break in the sun. The royal family fell into a furious cauldron of politics. They were ruthlessly criticized by a hostile Afrikaner press. The king was openly mocked when speaking the Dutch Afrikaans language in a gesture of reconciliation. The king became angry when he realized that security was not there to protect him but to stop him from mixing with his black subjects. He bluntly called the South African authorities the Gestapo. The visit failed. The National Party came to power, creating the legal racism of apartheid and in time breaking with the empire, rejecting the king and declaring a republic. The royal family returned to London in the spring of 1947 and the princess's engagement was announced. The king gave away his daughter the same year, on the 20th of November, at Westminster Abbey. In the years that followed, the king became increasingly unwell. Winston Churchill was to say of these times that the king walked with death. Throughout the war, the burnt-out king hardly slept and chain-smoked. A string of smoking-related illnesses struck at the king. The queen, her daughters and Philip increasingly appeared without and in place of the king, who saved his strength for events that demanded the sovereign's presence. At the annual trooping of the colour ceremony, the king abandoned riding on horseback and rode in a carriage. In 1951, the truth of the king's condition could not be hidden, as he returned early from a Scottish holiday for treatment. Just 56 years old, he had the appearance of a man 20 years older. Anxious crowds gathered outside the palace where news bulletins were posted. ex-King Edward returned to London. The military bands that marched outside the palace muffled their instruments. The treatment was officially called a lung resection. The king had lung cancer and one lung was removed. But the tumor had spread. The king would die. This news was not told to the British people and the nation shared in the Queen's self-delusion that the King would make a full recovery. I am very grateful indeed for your welcome and for your kind reference to the King. I'm glad to say that he continues to make most excellent progress. It was Queen Elizabeth's strength that she was always cheerful and optimistic. It came at a price. She was called an emotional ostrich those that know her have said what she doesn't want to see, she doesn't look at. People that needed her couldn't always get her help.
When Princess Elizabeth and Philip took the place of the King and Queen on a tour of Canada in 1951, they traveled with black mourning clothes and the papers needed for her to be declared Queen. It is possible to see the seriousness on this trip that made George VI's daughter a target of criticism for not smiling enough. But this young woman knows her father is dying. The king was ill again over the Christmas of 1951. In the new year of 1952, the king was to tour East Africa, Australia and New Zealand. Elizabeth and Philip went in his stead. On the 31st of January 1952, they flew to Kenya. Those who knew the king said they had never seen the king so distressed at their parting. As he saw Elizabeth turn on the steps of the plane, it was the last time he would ever lay eyes on his beloved daughter. And it was the last time George VI was seen in public. The king died six days later while asleep of a thrombosis. The British people had not been told of his illness. The news was devastating. The king died too young, before his time, adored by his two great passions in life, his family and the British people. As George lay in state, the queues of those wishing to just walk past his coffin were stupefying to the imagination. Ex-King Edward attended the funeral, hoping for reconciliation and a return to the family fold. But the Windsor women closed ranks, and he was not even invited to eat with them. Edward spoke with his mother, Queen Mary, and his brother's widow, now titled Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. He wrote to Wallace that while there was sugar on the surface, there was granite underneath. George VI's wife would never forgive Edward and Wallace for destroying her family life, both forcing her husband onto the throne and into an early grave. The model of royalty, the leadership that George and Elizabeth gave the British people, took Britain through the darkest times of history. In George and Elizabeth for a short time, the public image of the monarchy met reality and created a royal family that was what Britain wanted and Britain needed. Elizabeth lived on for more than half a century. On her death, people talked of the end of an era, of things never being the same again, of Britain changing forever. The strength and success of what George and Elizabeth built was at the same time a burden to those that followed, a load made heavier by changing times. The model they created, and that was followed by their daughter, was too perfect. It belonged to a time where deference and respect were automatic, and the media kept their distance. Without deference and distance, it failed. How George and Elizabeth in old age would have met the challenges of the 1960s and 70s, and those of the 1980s, when the model of royal family life disintegrated into chaos is pure speculation. Yet the truth remains that George and Elizabeth were in the right place at the right time for the British people. George VI could have passed into history a forgotten king whose reign and life passed quietly by in an unremarkable succession of uneventful years. Fate did not allow him that life. Instead, he is an unforgettable and quite remarkable figure in British history. George VI and his Queen were a good King and Queen, a great King and Queen, and above all, the right King and Queen, 
for their time. Thank you.